thanks uh, everyone. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for uh, inviting me to present this work. Um, yeah, today in this paper, GPTs or GPTs, uh, and really look at labor market and high potential of LLMs. Joint work with Pina Alamondo, Pamela Michigan, and uh, Daniel Rollins. Um, I'll touch quickly on kind of our overall motivations for why we wanted to study this topic, uh, how we did it, what some of the key findings were, um, and then uh, hope to touch on some additional like validation exercises and some exploratory analysis that isn't in the uh, current like working paper, um, and wrap up with uh, takeaways and kind of looking forward for uh, what's next. So. Um, if we imagine like a wonderful outcome, you know, economic and labor market outcome for uh, this, you know, generative AI, rapid kind of technological uh, progress that might look something like, uh, you know, inclusive economic growth and just broadly shared uh, prosperity, things like leveling the playing field that we've, we've uh, been discussed today. Um, I think that's clearly, you know, not a guarantee. And uh, we've seen, however, you know, in the past that these uh, labor-saving technologies have been you know, central drivers of uh, economic growth, but that they've also had these large and differential um, impacts at the like family and worker level um, that you know persist over time and have real costs for, for individuals, um, especially you know having to make kind of increasingly frequent labor market transitions, especially up across occupations, um, has lots of costs, can be very hard, and um, we'd love to try to you know um, try to anticipate and estimate what these labor market impacts might be um, as the kind of technology is still developing to help inform you know, relative, relevant uh, decisions around development deployment policy. So what did we do to uh, like make a dent in some of this uh, evidence? Um, wanted to investigate uh, the, the claim that the large language models may possess some of the key criteria of general purpose technologies that have been outlined in uh, the literature. There's three of them. One, that um, this you know, technology is pervasive. So, you know, pervasive across the economy and lots of occupations and use cases. The second is that it, um, this technology should improve over time. Um, and the third key component is that the well, you know, general purpose technologies should spawn complementary innovations. And I think we take, for the most part in this paper, we focus a lot on this pervasiveness question, trying to assess the uh, applicability of language models to lots of economic activity in the US. Um, and we take as an observed reality that like they are improving over time um, at the moment. Um, and we do a little bit of work um, similar to some of the other work that's been presented today, looking at how uh, these um, frontier language models are impacting um, the development of complementary innovations particularly looking at software development activity. And I'll touch on that at the end. So um, what did we do? Our approach was uh, had lots of borrowed things from other uh, you know, previous literature. Um, but we did add a couple new things as well. And so um, I, we developed a, a, a rubric that's most similar to the work of uh, Eric Brynjolfsson, um, Tom Mitchell, and Daniel Rock in their 2017 and 2018 papers um, that assessed uh, these, the, oh, oh, DLS own at labor market tasks in the US based on, uh, I think it was 19 or so criteria for like the suitability of this task to, to machine learning. Um, and then, yeah, assess kind of each task, you know, on all these 19 criteria. We developed a, you know, kind of took that approach, developed a rubric to map um, own at tasks, the descriptions of tasks to the capabilities of uh, language models today. Um, so not just machine learning, but like, you know, these generative AI systems and all the other like uh, embeddings, capabilities, and the like. Um, and in addition to that, we, uh, you know, and so we had a team of, uh, including ourselves and some other researchers, a team of folks kind of evaluate these ONET tasks on, uh, based on this rubric. And then we uh, turned that rubric into a prompt, kind of tuned it a little bit for agreement rates with, uh, this like these human labels and um, at GPT-4 try to classify all these worker tasks based on this exposure rubric as well. Um, in addition to just looking at like the, the potential kind of overlapping capabilities between language models and uh, worker tasks, we include this like speculative, speculative uh, class of exposure in our rubric that uh, accounts for the like, potential productivity gains from 
um, complementary software that might, you know, you can imagine if you're working in a company, um, you may not get a uh, productivity gain from just using ChatGPT alone, but if you were able to plug it into like your company's database or the software that you're using on a daily basis, um, perhaps you know you could expect your paths to be impacted differently. Okay. Here's just a quick overview. Many of you are probably familiar with this ONAT like task data set, but it's uh, about a little over 19,000 tasks um, that kind of represent things that workers are doing in the economy. Um, collected by the BLS. Very brief summary of our exposure rubric here. Um, there's much more detail in like the appendix of our paper to check out. But the kind of main three kind of main uh, components of this are this E0 metric that represents um, what that you know a task is uh, not expected to be to to uh, realize any significant kind of productivity gain if you are able, if you just insert. Uh, a language model into the like production process for that task. Uh, E1 is kind of our highest level of exposure, which um, represents a, uh, a doubling of productivity or a 50% 50, 50 increase in or decrease in the time it takes to complete the task with the same quality. Um, if you just use ChatGPT or like the OpenAI playground, and then E2 is this more like speculative measure of okay, make an assumption about like uh, using plugins or using, uh, plug, you know, plugging this tool into the, the tools you're, the software tools you're already using, and um, if that were the case, you might expect, you know, a uh, significant productivity gain. Um, these charts show kind of uh, the, like, agreement across the GP, when we ran this rubric through GPT-4 for all the tasks versus the human ratings, and it, this is tasks um, then aggregate up to the occupation level. Um, and so you can see, you know, pretty similar uh, ratings when you look at like the share of tasks within an occupation um, that uh, are exposed based on like these measures, um, which is encouraging. And I think there's been lots of other work. And actually, in the other session, there's a paper being presented now about like how to use uh, GPT for for market research. I think it's like you know encouraging for us social scientists that you can use these models to help with things like you know classification. Um, these. So what do we find in terms of exposure? Um, in terms of pervasiveness, on average, 14% uh, of tasks within the average occupation are exposed at this, were rated to be exposed at this E1 level. Um, when you account for you know, these speculative assumptions about um, plugins with additional software or complementary software, that jumps a lot to uh, you know, somewhere between 46 and 55% of tasks within the average occupation. As exposed, and then we, we kind of uh, arbitrarily made, you know, put this um, intermediate measure where we scale the factor, um, that E2 factor, down by a half to account for, like, in the real world, there are lots of costs to developing software and, and having these, um, you know, uh, plugins, and so that's kind of an intermediate measure uh, to represent, you know, that uh, exposure between the two kind of core measures there. This plot shows what kind of all these different measures of exposure. Uh, throughout the economy, and so that x-axis uh, represents like the share of an occupation's task, ex tasks exposed at each level, and then the y-axis represents the share of occupations in the economy uh, exposed at that level or above. Um, and so if you just focus on, say, like the middle two lines, those are those intermediate measures that I just walked, you walked talked about, um, and I wish I could point or something, but the if you look, for example, at, you know, you want to know how many um, occupations in the economy have this exposure, you know, have half of their tasks exposed, it's somewhere around a little over 20%. Um, that's kind of how you can interpret that. Um, so this is our paper, it's a good, good like, chart to kind of gauge overall exposure across occupations. Um, one of the more, more interesting findings uh, that is in line with other, you know, recent literature on, on this topic is in these bottom two plots where you can see that when you look at this um, intermediate kind of measure for exposure at the occupation level, and you map it to the wage distribution of workers in those occupations. Um, higher wage work has much more kind of potential productivity gain from integrating these systems um, than lower wage work, and then it kind of tails off at the very high end of income distribution. The top two plots show there's not too much, you know, uh, relationship between, like, the concentration of jobs or employment and exposure to these technologies. So this is all, you know, where, where, what we're doing here is like developing this rubric. We tested it a bunch, but and we had humans, you know, we had, we had people familiar with these models rate, uh, you know, these tasks, and we then had GPT-4 to it. Um, 
we try to, you know, so you probably want to try to validate that a little bit. One thing we did um, was then ran a survey with actual ChatGPT users um, and asked them, uh, self-reported, you know, what tasks do you use, do you use ChatGPT for in your work? Got these self-reported tasks back and kind of mapped them onto the ONET tasks that were that we um, you know evaluated, trying to see like, okay, how how were we actually uh, you know rating these based on on uh, you know real world usage? Does it line up? Um, and what we found was, was pretty encouraging. Um, I think so. Three percent of the the, the self-reported tasks that people uh, wrote back, we had about like I think it was like nine hundred and seventy responses. Um, three percent of them we did mark as like not exposed at all. Um, about um, sixty-five or so percent were this got this E one label, which you expect to be the highest, which you wanted to see it be the highest. And then some 30 to 35 percent or something or so got were, were marked E2. Um, to kind of visual, visualize this, we took the I took the embeddings of all that self those self-reported tasks, mapped them to the embeddings of the ONET tasks, and then kind of overlaid them here. And so what you want to see is that these black dots, which represent the self-reported user tasks that they're doing, you know, using ChatGPT for in their work, you want to see them be um, concentrated or overlaying with these E1 and E2 dots. And not the E1, uh, the E zeros. And so, for the most part, that's what we see, uh, which is an encouraging sign. Um, yeah, kind of showing that you know, hopefully, like this is actually sort of directionally correct in terms of like rating, rating these tasks. Um, some work we did, very uh, related to previous work today, looking at GitHub uh, data to try to see like, okay, are the um, are these technologies, you know, is the deployment of of ChatGPT of increasing uh, software development activity in any observable way. Um, so we scraped uh, forks count data from uh, like 1,100 repositories. We we class we we uh, group them based on or had these kind of two query sets. One of them is uh, trying to identify about five or six hundred repositories that are building on top of LLMs. Um, that's this LLM query line, the blue, and then. Uh, another, another group, which here could be, you know, like a plausible control group, is more statistics and like data science work only in these in these repositories. And try and the, the plot here you see is the uh, over time um, fork activity by month. I mean, as you can see, there's just like this explosion in these like you know forking activity. So you know, forking a repository and then doing something with it. Um, when after ChatGPT comes out, we did kind of three different difference in difference uh, uh, identification approaches. This synthetic difference in difference felt was kind of our main like estimation technique. All of them show at a weekly level in the four months after ChatGPT that um, you know this uh, this release is driving about a seven to eight uh, forks per week impact in um, additional kind of developer activity. Can I ask how much time I have? Seven minutes. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. All right, I should have talked more about the rest of this stuff. <laughs> um, okay, so then some like exploratory analysis um, I wanted to present. So, can we, so what we haven't done so far is like say, make any claims about automation. Um, as you could tell, that the, the kind of initial rubric and the, the rubric we presented in this paper is very focused on the productivity gains that a worker could get. When they are in the loop and they are like, and they're you know, using integrating this, these systems into their workflows, um, and well, you know, we haven't made any claims about actual kind of substitution, as in uh, you know, more in the work. Um, the here we we um, tried you know, based, because we saw like these pretty pretty uh, reasonable uh, agreement rates across across this like GPT four rating and human rating with the. That more productivity focused exposure metric. We did uh, develop an automation rubric that's more focused on uh, assessing the level of reliability one would need um, in terms of model output to actually you know, sub substitute for this work and remove a human from the loop. Um, and that's, I can share that with, with folks that are interested. Um, we did not have like human raters validate this aside from me and co authors kind of doing some, some labeling ourselves. Um, but what you can see is like there's very few tasks in the economy that workers are doing in this ONET data set 
that are low stakes enough that like you would you you, you feel confident that these models can um, fully automate without any, you know fully removing a human from the loop. Um, if you if you take this more you know you can so that's like one one interesting finding from this like exploratory work. If you treat these um, this automation measure as kind of a continuous uh, thing, so not just like a binary, like can you can you reliably fully automate this task or not, but more of a continuous, is there potential um, to uh, you know to, to uh, automate, or is this like something that needs to be done in person and therefore there's no potential at all? And um, then comparing that to the exposure measures at an occupation level, you can see they're they're really highly correlated. And so I guess you know, that suggests that there's some measure of, uh, some component of this exposure measure that includes um, you know, an aspect of the likelihood of a task being automated, perhaps you know, some share of, of some tasks being automated, but we can't really make any you know, claims about automation, but we did you know, run, run uh, this through, and there seems to be like a correlation between at the occupation level of kind of what, what can, can be automated versus get these productivity gains, and overall, very few tasks are you know seem to be uh, capable of being like you know reliably automated all the time. So key takeaways: um, it seems like language models. I feel like I'm not sure how much we're adding here, but it seems like language models have uh, several key properties of general purpose technologies based on these you know definitions in the literature. Um, what that implies, however, is that like you know the equilibrium effects of general purpose technologies have been like very hard to predict, and so we should. Uh, you know, be cautious about making forecasts. Um, to uh, we, we find there's broad exposure of current work in the U.S. to these language model capabilities. And that higher wage work appears more exposed to these productivity gains. Um, that does not translate kind of you know one to one to uh, to uh, you know labor automation or decreased labor demand. Or at least you know based on what our findings. Um, but there's definitely reason to expect like many, many jobs uh, to change and be impacted and how to go through this process of updating kind of the skills required and like process adjustments, um, you know, within a production process. Um, future research and things that I think would be like really great that this suggests, you know, we should be doing more of. Um, what we do here and what a lot of other work uh, in this kind of stream of literature has done is treated these occupations as kind of a, a sum of their tasks. So when, you, when we present occupation level measures here, it's just a share of tasks exposed. It doesn't say anything about kind of like, when, you know, in all, in all of our jobs, there's lots of complex like interdependencies across those tasks. And I think um, doing more work to try to, uh, you know, map out like the information flows across those tasks and where the productivity and automation bottlenecks are kind of across a flow of tasks in the project would be really exciting. Um, I think one thing that this work shows is like the potential uh, jump in productivity impacts from these additional software, um, you know, complements that, that are being developed that we've seen in industries such as um, like legal research assistant software and all in the coding tools. These additional like UIs and software that are built on top of these models can have like you know, really significant boosts in terms of usability and impacts, and so. Um, empirically measuring that seems, you know, really important to understand the labor market impacts. And given all these potential changes, um, you know, um, developing work to, you know, think through kind of what policy options should we be considering to kind of make skill changes and uh, occupation transitions easier for workers um, also seems uh, super important as well. Um, thanks.